Claro, ok. First try, it worked. Ok, so our plan for today will be finally, if once it for all, to finish our exercise on the compressor, ok, the subsea compressor in Snevit, uh, which, you know, there are not many projects, um, subsea, I think we have in the short term maybe the Ormen Lange, they will install a compressor, uh, I think Snevit, they will install a compressor, so it's becoming more and more popular. But currently, I think the only project we have in the world, subsea, it's um, it's uh, Oscar, okay. But kind of um, the basic principle is applied if you have a subsea field, if you have a non-shore field, if you have any other type of field, okay. So and, and I think it's very important if you are considering boosting with uh, even for you know a small field with a wellhead compressor. Sometimes they use in the U.S. just to try to suck more um, more gas out of the single well uh, this the same principles apply okay here we are doing it at a big scale a big project mega project a few million billion dollars but you know this the same principle can be applied to many to a small scale okay the simply the compressor you know won't be 11 megawatts but maybe it will be a few kilowatts or uh, okay so, but it's, it's essentially the same principle, okay? So, uh, yeah, so let's see a bit the notes from last, let me just check, okay, it's recording, uh, from last lecture, we uh, had this uh, to explain the test map that you do in, in terms of the polytropic head and the actual rate at the inlet of the compressor but then I told you we what we are going to do, we are going to keep the map the same that was measured in test conditions with air, with um, uh, atmospheric pressure at the inlet and with 20 degrees Celsius at the inlet and we are going to convert all the points we have in the actual case to that map. Okay, So we are going to use the inverse of this, uh, of this equation. Okay, we are going to clear from there the equivalent test uh, conditions. Okay? And I just show you how some picture how the system looks like. Of course, I told you if you have a poor boy in uh, in the U.S., you have an independent company, you won't have, you will need a separator, but you probably won't have all of these coolers, fancy equipment. Okay, here we want to control everything remotely, and this is going to be, this is now on the, I think the water depth is like 300 meters. Okay, so you don't need, you cannot send every time something happens. Uh, a guy just go on there and check what happens okay you have to make everything prepared for remote operation okay and such that it will be staying there for 10 15 years without you having to do anything okay so you have to make your system prepared for that case when you are in a non-shore installation we'll send the guy what happened just go and check you know you send the companies and the contractor and it's much the system becomes much uh, much uh, simpler Okay, but that's the calculations we found. I think you have the file in our, uh, I think I uploaded to the, to my website. For those of you who want to, I, I will, you're going to work is on the second exercise, this class, okay? So I'm going to do that ju just to show you, but uh, this one just to show you but it's here okay this file i think that's the latest version and that's at least it has what we have done last time in class okay for those of you who were not there so you see first that's what we got so first we have like five years where we have um where we have numbers actually okay but then you have some other years where you have this value problem okay and this value problem if you can trace it back to its origins okay it's essentially because we are trying to produce a rate here we get the first value problem okay and essentially it's telling you that and remember wellhead pressure we calculate from bottom hole okay we are moving reservoir pressure bottom hole pressure to IPR fixing the rate and then we're moving bottom hole pressure to the top to, to wellhead okay with the tubing equation and when we are calculating when we have a value error you remember we have there a square root 
of a number, of a pressure minus a rate, okay, something multiplied by a rate. So what's happening there, the term inside that square root is becoming negative, okay, so it tells you essentially you cannot flow, if you want to impose that rate per well, okay, 2.2, and you have that bottom hole pressure, no way, guy, you cannot do it, okay, you have to change something. So that also tells you that not only doesn't matter if the company tries to sell you, comes the contractor to sell, I have the best compressor we have invented, okay? It's made out of gold, and it gives you an efficiency of 100%. You say, there is no point. At that year, I cannot do anything. Simply, I'm limited by my system, okay? And that's the thing, when you go to the field, when you are working in your company, that's something you have to remember, okay? You see, what are the limiting factors to obtain that rate? In this case, it doesn't matter how much, how big compressor you have, fancy compressor you have, the only thing that matters is that you cannot, you simply cannot reach to the suction of the compressor even with that rate, okay, at that particular time. That might be if so a company comes and tells you, we have a downhole compressor, okay, we can give you energy just when you're reaching the bottom hole. And then you say, oh, you start to think, will that be, make sense? Okay, but if they say, well, no, it will be again the same thing, subsea, but I have a better compressor, you say, well, no, you know, I, I, I know I cannot deliver that rate. Okay. So, how do we make, you see the points that are outside, right, of the map. How do we make the points bring them inside of the map? Let's start with the first point, okay, which was, what is the problem here with the first point? Let's see, let's check first the power. Okay, power seems fine. Uh, one, and we say we had 11. Okay, we, one compressor is 11, so that's fine. 6.5, still fine. 13.6, what does it mean this uh, in year three? We need to have two, right? At this point, if we split, let's say, will be 6.5 and 6.5 megawatts. Can we split just like that? just the power in two, you think? Okay, so if we have one compressor, let's say, we have some mass flow of gas coming through that compressor. Then we have here, in a compressor we enter is like this uh, trapezoidal shape and you enter through the thickest or the broadest side and then you come out from the kind of the thinnest side okay and that you're saying indicating the compression of the gas and if you see in reality if you see some um, how the actual compressor looks like it was a nicer picture here Okay, you see here the suction is actually a big hole because the, the pressure is low and the velocity of the gas is high. So you have to make a wide passage, you have to make a, th uh, a big passage to avoid problems with erosion, to avoid sonic velocity, to avoid all kind of issues. But after that, when you start compressing, the density of the gas starts to increase. Okay, and then you can pack more gas in the same place, in the same volume. Okay, the velocity gets smaller and you see the discharge I think in this case they are simply these two holes. Okay, so you see a significant change in the cross section area on the of the compressor. Okay, I think here you see the suction is a big um, big channel, then goes through the compressor, comes out, is a very small pipe. Okay, this this is this uh, thing. I guess this is the discharge. So let's say we have this case, P suction and P discharge. And we have some power, right, that we need, that we have one equation that we need power one. Now, if we are going to put two compressors for the same delta P, so then we say simply two compressors in parallel will be Mg divided by two. And we put one compressor here and we put another compressor, exactly the same, identical. Okay. 
And what we say is that the suction pressure and the discharge pressure are the same. Okay, so you see essentially, and if you see the equation we had, we used last time for power, should be someplace here, okay, it depends actually on, on the mass flow, okay, so this one we know it depends on the delta P, right, from which pressure to which pressure I'm increasing, but this mass flow, if I divide into two, simply I would slash the power in two, right, for one stream. So, but I tell you, it's not exactly like that. We have this efficiency, so far we have said is constant, right? But that efficiency, if you see here on the map that I told you, is plotting with different efficiencies, okay? And if you see, depending on the rate that I have and the HP that I have, I will have different efficiencies. That's actually what happens. So if your compressor, you operate at half the rate, okay, you're going to have a different efficiency, okay, so be careful with that, okay, so far we're assuming that this polytropic efficiency is simply constant, we're using the same, okay, 0.7, but in reality, if you change the rate, let's say you're slashing in two, right, you will probably, let's say instead of 400, you will use 200,000, 200, okay, and then instead of having an efficiency of, I don't know, uh, here you have Efficiency 66, efficiency 70 percent, efficiency 73, and efficiency 74. Okay, so instead of having a 200, instead of having an efficiency of um, um, 74.5, you're going to have an efficiency of at 400. You're going to have an efficiency of maybe 66. Okay. So just take that into account. We are not making our exercise that complicated, but take into account that, so let's say here, power per compressor is uh, power one, okay, this power that I have one divided by two because the mass flow was halved, okay, was halved, okay, but, I'm going to put here a big but, but in reality, okay, the efficiency of the compressor changes, okay, when the mass flow changes because the Q actual, okay, at the inlet of the compressor is reduced. Okay? I tried to put it written so you remember you you cage and uh, I know that we have students we say yes yes and then you go back home and you say what was this guy talking about? Okay? I don't remember. So I put it there so you have it at least uh, you know written. Okay? So we know it's halved because the equation simply tells me it's halved, okay? The equation is simply saying, well, if I reduce this by half, this one will also be reduced by half. Not the total, okay? But per compressor, it will be reduced. But keep in mind, this guy would also change. Okay, and we have, we have to take that into account. Okay, so we know we can have, I think for that exercise, we have, we could have two compressors in parallel. So we have, like, that's what they have also in Osgar. They have 22 megawatts total. So you see, well, at least here, during these years, I could use, in principle, two compressors. Okay, from year three, I have to use two compressors. Year four, also. Well, not really, right? 24, I'm outside. It's 22. But then this year, definitively, I cannot only with two compressors. No way. So you already get an idea that you will be able to work in more or less plateau for four more years 
but then you know you won't be able to produce in plateau okay and certainly not after year five so now you know from this very simplified analysis that you can it's more realistic to say I will have with two compressors I can prolong my plateau for four years no, no more than that okay so now let's go to the other part which was one was the power right the discharge temperature you see here here it looks um, the discharge pr uh, temperature this is simply by doing this uh, following the polytropic line right that we have done okay we have done before we followed the polytropic line and then we see what temperature discharge temperature do we have and you see here actually these are quite okay but then we start to over pass this number of 140 okay 180 and then we might have issues with you know seals are very important seals this is a machine where I'm compressing and increasing the pressure in every stage okay like we see here okay every stage that I pass I'm compressing okay I think here I go in this direction compress 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 and every time it's going to be at a higher pressure so there is one thing that because I have a fluid at high pressure it can also leak into the previous stages where I have low pressure okay but it can also leak into I have because I have the motor and I don't want any of the working fluid my field fluid to be touching that motor okay or to be anywhere near the motor it has a different fluid, it has it needs lubrication, it needs all kind of things. So I don't want it to pass to the motor side. Okay? And the way it looks like, it's a bit I think our compressor is a bit like that without the part on the right. Okay? So you don't want it to go inside this part and then it starts to displace the oil that I have there lubricating and it's causing trouble. Okay? So you have to have all of these seals, they have to be intact. And if you increase the pre the temperature to 180 you're going to damage them very quickly okay so it's very just to keep the machine operating seals in compressors pump you have to be sure that they are their integrity is guaranteed okay you are, well, have to make sure that they're doing their work which we cannot guarantee here in this year okay and it's not that we can put a cooler okay because we need will need a cooler inside cooling inside which can be done in in onshore but not offshore okay you 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 need to have some cooling in between the stages okay because simply from here to here is increasing from 67 to 188 okay so one way to do it you could extract cool it outside and then bring it back in but then it's more expensive you need connections coolers etc okay what else we have the temperature constraint, we have the power constraint. We know already this year is not looking at all promising, right? Power problems, temperature problems, it's like you want to get out of this year, okay? You don't want to... What else do we have to take into account? Okay, finally, I think what we had from our notes last time was, I think was not this class, but was the class before. Okay, we said maximum delta P, we haven't been informed, we just assume that with the map we're taking care of that. Power constraint, minimum suction pressure, I think in this case we said 10 bar. And let's see it, how is the suction pressure, 31, so it's fine. But here, as I told you, we are not able to reach the suction of the compressor with that rate. Uh, what else? Operational map and the outlet temperature we know here we will have a problem in year five and we know here we haven't checked this condition okay but we know already from this figure that is going to be out and you see the first these are the first two years and that's something that happens typically during kind of early operation of the compressor the 
polytropic head, that means the pressure ratio, is too low to fall inside the map. Okay? This map is limited to a speed of, I think this is 70% of design, which design is given uh, here, is 8,500 RPM. Okay, so 70, oh yeah. it's like 5,600, okay, and the maximum is 9,350. And you can operate not higher than that, because you start getting vibration, too much heating, it's going to deteriorate the, the rotating surfaces, and also you cannot operate lower than that. Maybe you get the same problem, a, a lot of vibration, the seals are not operating properly, so you have to be confined to these two uh, limits. So what can you do? It's not a simple problem, okay? It's complicated. You have to do all kind of magic to bring that point inside, okay? So if you remember the, um, I think the exercise, let's see, I think we had it Okay, I think you have it. I gave it to you before. So you see here you have a choke and you have a cooler and you have another cooler. So let's try to see with this choke you can reduce really the the available pressure. Okay, so you can artificially, at least for the first years where you have an issue, the point being inside the map, you can artificially increase that delta P to bring the point inside the map. Okay? So let's try to do that. That's what I, I told you. Include a column with the uh, delta P choke at the inlet of the compressor. Okay. So let's say what happens if you put a 10 bar choke. Let's go to the plot. You see how the point moved? And why is it moving not only up, but it's moving to the right? The, the, remember, this is the local rate at the inlet of the compressor. So that is a function also of the inlet pressure at the compressor. When we drop the pressure, we're increasing it, and therefore it's moving to the right. Okay? It's like it's expanding, it's occupying more volume, and therefore the local volume rate is becoming bigger. Okay, so let's try with 20, still it's not inside. Okay, and it's moving to the right. Now it's almost inside the map, but it's a bit to the right. Okay. How can we fix it? How can we bring it back into the map? You have, also we have this cooler. Okay, that means that I have here a temperature of 67, and let's try to bring it, let's try to see if we can bring it to, you know, to, um, if we can reduce, you know, the HP. So I think this cooler, I think is given here, it can achieve a maximum delta T of, I think that that is wrong. I think it's a maximum delta T of 20 degrees Celsius, okay? So let's try to use the cooler. DT at the inlet cooler, and let's say we want to say a 20 degree difference. Okay, the point is moving inside. Let's try the bigger. So it's not not really going inside. Okay. No matter how I change here, it's like increasing already too much, and uh, I don't manage to bring it back, not even with the cooler. Okay, let's see if this is 40. I think, uh, no, 50. Okay, now finally came inside. Okay, when the temperature is what, what was specified in this, um, the minimum pressure that the cooler can achieve is 20 Celsius. Okay, that's the way you bring it back in. Back in. So now the point is here, let's see if we can use less, you know, less, uh, I don't want to uh, spend energy unnecessarily. 
Okay, so now it's still inside. Let's see if we can reduce even further. 20. I don't want to remember when I'm choking, I'm losing energy, and then in the compressor I'm giving energy. Things like looks like a bit a stupid thing, okay? But it's simply to make it bring the point inside the map. Okay? So I don't use the choke unless I really need it, unless I really um Okay, let's say there that will be the first point for the first year. Okay, efficiency, polytropic efficiency is you see the ISO efficiency line 66. So actually here we shouldn't use efficiency 0.7, but we should change it to 0.66. And we check again power okay 12. I need two compressors, okay, it's more than 11. What happens if I need two compressors? Is this plot still valid? You know, we just did the first point, right? Everything is inside the map. Uh, the efficiency is 66. But now the power is, instead of being 1.5, remember from before, now it was 12. That means I cannot use a single compressor. I have to use two. But what happens if I use two? The rate has to change. Okay, so now I have to divide. I have to divide someplace. Let's say this guy by two. Right? And now I have to plot instead of this column, I have to plot this A AQ column. AP and A. Because now I'm using two compressors in this configuration. Okay, now I'm in trouble again. Okay, and you do the same now. So I, now I have to increase again the, uh, I'm not sure exactly, we can just maybe plot the one of year one, which is 46, to avoid having the rest of the points. Okay, so I'm now I'm here. And I have maybe I have to reduce again now, choke a bit more. Okay, to bring it inside the map. Okay, and now the efficiency won't be 66, but it will be close to 73. Okay, so now I have to change again here the efficiency. Okay, then I have to check if I have the power is 18, which is below 22. Okay, so that means I will be able, seems like, by choking at the inlet, 30 bar, by cooling down to 20, and by having two compressors, I'm able to operate in year one. Okay, and maintain plateau. So I leave to you the other years, okay, I hope you do it, like a home class exercise. But uh, this one, I, I before I send it like a homework for you to do, you know, in groups and at home. Okay, I won't we I won't be giving this exercise like a graded exercise this year. Okay, I just wanted to do it here in front of you, and also that you work on it further if you see what happens now in year two. Okay, what kind of tricks do I have to make? Okay, but uh, it's still going to the, for the exam, it still is uh, going to be included in the exam, but um, it's not like a home exercise you have to deliver to get great. Okay, but I suggest you to go now to year two and also try to understand the logic, okay, behind, uh, behind that. And you will see, I think, for this problem, it tells you this compressor can only operate for, uh, I think, for the first three years. Okay, after that, it will, you have to reduce the rate. There is no other way. You try choking, you try cooling, you try all kind of things, and, and you still can, um, you won't be able to, to first to meet the power constraint 
or to bring the point inside the map. Okay, I think that's what we have gotten uh, previous years. That clear? More or less? Okay. <coughs> Let's, before we abandon this part and we go to our the topic for today, okay, so let me just copy that and um, okay, so in the first year we need to choke and we need to cool to bring the point inside and it's already coming inside but it's very tricky, so if you're you just the equipment can have some very tricky constraints. Okay, no, it's not that you simply, oh, I, I simply reduce the pressure. Some people, when they model this case, they say, oh, well, simply put a low pressure. Like the suction can be reduced to 10. Fine. And then we see how much do we get, how much plateau. And they get maybe 10 years more plateau. And they say, well, fine, we find a compressor that makes it. Okay, and then you start looking, well, no, but you're violating the power constraint, you're violating the temperature constraint, you're violating the map, okay? And then you have to go back to the board and then you have to start changing all of that, okay? So, just to give you an idea, the equipment is important, okay? It's not that you can match, have any equipment, you have all the money in the world, you can buy the equipment that will match your, your okay? It's, it's a really a special machine that has a, a, an operating uh, map. So I'm not sure what to copy here. Maybe I can copy like in two parts. Okay, well, please try to, I know that you have the regular homework, which is graded. I guess that one has priority, but you know, preparing to the exam, just try to repeat at least this first year by yourselves, okay? And it's also a, very good if you try also the other years you will see other challenges and you see after some years that compressor simply you you cannot maintain the rate okay i think it's after year three Okay, so for the first year we had to use a delta T at the cooler to be able to operate for year one for the first year of, comp of compression. The delta P of the choke at the inlet was how much? 30, I think. 30 and the delta t at the cooler and the delta t at the cooler was 47 okay simply to make it feasible to make that point that i will be able to operate okay now before we go to the uh, uncertainty quantification evaluation uh, I want just to say, if you remember last lecture, I think I showed you in this presentation that they were talking something about uh, compressor duty, okay? And if you remember what was the duty, is the mass flow, is actually the heat that is able to remove the mass flow times the difference in enthalpy. So let's just calculate the duty for year one, how much the inlet, com inlet cooler has to remove, okay? Just to see if we get a number close to these, close to these guys, okay? That's also something I have to be careful, how realistic, what is the delta T I can achieve in the cooler, okay? So let's estimate cooler duty, okay? And cooler duty we said is mass flow times H in, right, minus H out, how much was the mass flow entering into the cooler? 
I think it's 155 right kilogram per second right and then we have the H at the inlet for that we use our uh, chart methane chart by the way this chart was made by a professor I think he's already retired uh, at NTNU it's a chart that was made here at, at NTNU with a program that he, he developed it's not measured but actually it's uh, everything is um, simulated, calculated okay so let's read for the suction that we have uh, of the cooler okay here we're looking at cooler suction what is the cooler suction? <coughs> cooler inlet the temperature is 67 and the pressure was okay the, temp the pressure should be before the choke oh no the cooler is after the choke right? in our drawing Okay, we are looking for the conditions is exactly here so you have to be after the choke so we have to use the pressure compressor suction which is 46 4.6 megapascals okay, so let's locate that point on the chart 50, 60, 70 so it's between these two lines 50, 60, 70 and then the pressure is 4.6 and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 so it should be between these two guys someplace here okay maybe there enthalpy 50 H in around okay you might have a better number kilojoule kilogram and the H out we assume the cooler there is some pressure drop in the cooler okay but we are not taking that into account so the discharge of the cooler is 20 degrees Celsius okay so H out will be temperature out is 20 as an assumption we're making that I gave you I say the cooler can go down to 20 because the seabed temperature is 4 and the pressure out is simply equal to the pressure in because we assume no pressure drop in the cooler okay so that's very simple we move down uh, here okay we move in this direction and there we have we go down Okay, and then we have like 50, 60, minus 60 maybe. Right? Are you getting similar numbers or are you just watching like a manager? You're just watching me do the work. You have also to train to be a manager, but don't try don't train all the time. Okay, you also have to be engineers, do work. Okay, H in. 50 H out minus 60 and that gives you how much 155 times 110 and this should be with three zeros and this gives you in megawatt how much is that One one zero one 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 times one fifty five divided by one e to the six seventeen. That is required cooling duty in year one of compressor of compression. how that looks like compared to the Oscar to this presentation we have
Okay, at least it's in the ballpark. Okay, it's not in the 100 megawatt or in the 0.1 megawatt. But that tells you actually that our cooler has to be either mu much bigger, okay, has to be able to drain more heat, has to be more efficient, okay, or we need maybe two coolers or, okay, but that tells you that at least it's in the ballpark, but we know it has to be, if we want to drain that amount of power, we have to, that amount of duty, we have to increase the size of the, okay, so let's put here, must be bigger than Oscar, must be You can also say, well, I now, and that was part of the thing, I think that the delta P should be 20, okay, not the, not the outlet temperature, but the outlet, uh, but I don't know then if it works on the map. Yeah, it still works. So that's the way you say, well, I don't buy a bigger cooler, I don't have, I spend more money on cooler, but simply I say, I reduce, I increase the inlet temperature. But then the power might fall outside. Okay, we see, check the power. 20, I'm still within 22, right? But now I'm spending more power. Before I was spending 18, now I have to spend 20, but I don't have to buy a cooler. Okay? I see you're all doing that and saying like, uh, aha moment, but do it yourself, okay? Do it yourselves because it's extremely tricky all of these changes you have to fulfill is like you know you have your family it gives you some constraints your wife gives you some constraints yourself give you some constraint your boss gives you some constraint and you have to fulfill all of these constraints right to navigate in life to have to keep the wife happy the boss happy the uh, so it's, it's the same thing you're here trying to keep everyone happy power temperature map um, okay cooler etc so let's put that note here okay the inlet cooler seems to have a too high duty okay so that it was uh, 17 that was was that what we found compared to Osgard Okay, and Osgard is already like an, a new installation. Okay, so therefore I have two options. Okay, make a bigger or maybe more efficient. Okay, or the other option is to delta T in the cooler must be reduced. Okay, but then that tells you but then more power is required. Okay, and also the outlet temperature will be higher. Which then you might violate this, this constraint. It's, it's a fun, it's really a fun, fun problem. And it's, and it's uh, realistic to, you know, in in the sense that what we can do in a classroom this might be a project with two months or six months you do in the company but it's actually capturing quite a lot of that complexity okay this this uh, this problem okay any question okay so now let's take a break and let's go now to switch to a, ver a bit of a different topic where we have how to quantify what how to deal with uncertainty so let's, uh, but let's take first a, f a 15 minutes break. Okay, let's go come back here at 10.20. Try to do it here very quickly. I don't ensure how good my results are, but you see we're able to keep um, the start of compression is uh, this here. So we're able to keep one, two, three, four years of compress compression, okay? And after that, you have to reduce the rate and but actually the reduction in rate is you know not as high as if you were producing with natural natural production uh, you see here we need the choke the first three years but then after that we don't need will be fully open choke at the inlet of the compressor to bring it inside the map I have used 
a delta T of the cooler fixed. This delta T of the cooler will depend a bit on the rate that is circulating through the cooler. Okay, if you have more rate, then you have like uh, less temperature drop. But um, I have assumed here constant. The efficiency we're going to see here now where it's coming from. One thing which is important is that the discharge we say has to be less than 140. Okay, which is the case for all the points. But after you see you have a discharge cooler, where is it? Here, okay, and that's simply because the pipeline, due to many issues, you know, pipelines they have a coating due to avoid corrosion. So this coating has a maximum temperature, allowable temperature. You also have, with temperature, the yield stress of the steel is also affected. Okay, so you have pipeline have to be, it has a like a temperature rating, okay, at which it is designed. So if you go higher than that, then it, you will start to get issues with corrosion, you start to get issues with integrity, you have to get thermal expansion, you start to get quite a lot of, a lot of nasty things. Uh, in our case, we're getting, if you see the numbers we're getting after the cooler, we're assuming the outlet cooler operates in the same delta T as the inlet, okay? You see here, we're reaching values of 100. And I think this is classified like a high temperature pipeline, okay? This is a pipeline that has to be designed a bit special to take into account such a high temperature. The coating material has to be different. Maybe the pipes have to be treated in a special way. So be, just be aware of that. Uh, the power, you see, we are within the power of the two compressors because we are reducing the rate here. It's increasing, increasing until I start to reduce the rate. And if we see the map, those are the points in the first years where I have to choke to bring it back inside the map, and these are the point in later years. I think we didn't check the inlet pressure. How is the inlet pressure? Should be greater than 10. Okay, so we are above 10. We have 30 minimum. Okay. Now, what can you say if you see this map and you are talking to the guy delivering the compressor with man? Okay, after you have done your analysis, what, what can you tell man that they have to do? Okay, high, high efficiency. You see that your compressor is actually, it seems that it's a bit too high, too big for your application, okay? Because you are covering for high rates, okay? And really you don't need such high rates, you need lower. And you want this to be, have the best efficiency possible. Now it has 73, but you can gain you know, 74.5. So if you had a higher efficiency, then, okay, let's see the effect of efficiency. If you have just 1.5, okay, points of efficiency, what effect does that have on power? 0 0.745. If I was able to, okay, so actually the power didn't change much. It's like half a megawatt, one megawatt. Okay, so maybe it's not that important. Zero point seventy-three. Okay, but in principle, you want the manufacturer to be like in in this operating region. Okay, and also you don't have to rotate maybe that fast. But from this plot, you can get the. You see that they will have to be increasing the speed of the compressor with every year. Okay, to to be able to operate year zero, year one of compression two, three, four, five, six, okay? But you have to make that happen, you have to reduce the rate. Okay, so I'm not sure if it's correct, but it's a solution, and I'm going to upload this file to, you know, to uh, to my website. Uh, but, you know, at, at least you try yourself and you see how you can make that point in a creative way inside. Okay, and uh, maybe we can take a plot of the rate, I think, we had, should be down to year 53, I think.
okay so that's actually that will be if I have compression that will be my plateau where before it was finishing ending here okay here I will have the decline and now I will continue expand the plateau and will uh, produce for longer time again when we are doing field development that's what we really care that uh, you know how much extension or we are planning on uh, improved um, oil recovery okay uh, the the original case I don't have it here but I think it was something like this and I'm getting all of this extra production with compression early which is not discounted okay I'm getting it at like sooner okay so it's early and extra production from compression okay which is increasing ultimately is increasing the MTB okay do you have any final comments questions before we move to a new topic no okay okay let, let's talk a bit about how to quantify uncertainty okay how to deal first to deal and then to quantify An uncertainty basically in the same Snovit uh, case that we were doing, what could be uncertain there at an early phase? You still haven't, maybe you have drilled a few wells, but you still haven't, you know, it's still not, a, it's not a system producing, a producing system. So what kind of uncertainties can you have in Snovit? For example, in the Snovit, in, in Snovit. Okay, she is a reservoir engineer, so she says very strongly, and that's extremely important, the, the G, okay, in our case, or the N in our case. Okay, that's a major source of uncertainty. And that's actually only something that reservoir engineers, they know already when the field is producing many, many years into production. Okay, sometimes you only know when they abandon, or they don't even know. Okay, they say, I don't know really how much did we have there. So that's a very big uncertainty that I have, okay? That has maybe a range, um, and we are going to see actually how to compute this G, okay? Uh, and this N. And how is it affecting our calculations? How is the G affecting and the N affecting our, our calculations? The production profile, right? That's what we use to calculate the NPV. So if you have a big N, in our, the case of a Snow White, okay, you can do this test very quickly. But if you have a big reservoir, might be producing for a long time and then decline. Okay, and if you have a small reservoir and you use the same plateau rate, it might just drop very sharply, very quickly. Okay, so that is big N or big G, and this is small G. And that matters because then my revenue stream is going to be significantly significantly different okay because remember I'm using these rates the only thing if you can well there are many things that reservoir engineers are good in field development okay but the most important thing that they are responsible for is to produce this plot this line okay everything can be summarized the manager says I want to get that line to be able to calculate cash okay how much uh, cash I'm receiving Okay, I have NG, for example. I can have uncertainty a bit on the um, on the productivity index. Okay, I can have in our case was you know the inflow equation was CR PR squared minus PWS squared to the power of n. So I can have some uncertainty related to to this C. Okay, 
Maybe I made one test, I tested the wheel, and I say, well, it has that C, very good production. But you go some other place outside in the field, and maybe there are some shale layers, it's a bit uh, uh, more tighter sand, so then you don't get the C that you, that, that you measured initially, okay? What other things can, can I have uncertainty on? Yeah, but that's related really with, in our case, with the snow, it is related with the G, right? And the N. So what, what other things? There is one thing that we, I think we mentioned it briefly, it's called the uptime, right? It's the number of productive days that I have during the year. And I told you it's like, can be something between 90 or 100% if I don't have any stops, but it's the number of days uh, producing days in the year okay divided by sometimes I say divided by 365 the number of total days in the year okay so if I let's say I have a lot of issues I have to shut down production um, I have to do intervention in wells frequently that uptime will go down okay I might have let's say 10 days 20 days I have to do simply maintenance and fixing on the field while if I have a very efficient system, I can simply push that to 100. So this guy calls additional OPEX, okay, operational expenditures, which are not that important, you'll say, because they are discounted towards, they are important to abandon the field. Okay, if I have a lot of problems, as people say, just get rid of that field, okay, or because I'm not making enough money. But the main cause is, um, cut in production okay which causes a cut in revenue and if you make the calculation that's really a major effect compared to the OPEX if I stop production for five days and I say well it costed so many millions to fix these wells to do intervention in these wells it's not actually comparable if you compare it to the loss of production that you're losing because you are not produ producing for five days, okay? Cut in revenue. Okay, so essentially, if we want to formulate that problem, we have variables, input variables used in engineering studies in field development, okay? are highly uncertain okay like Arpita was mentioning before porosity for example you don't know you don't have a unique value which is simply have a minimum and a maximum and I don't really know I know that these are the variation and I know there is one value which is like the average but I don't know really how it's changing between these two numbers okay and affect and affect the value of KPIs okay key performance indicators that are used to to discriminate different development alternatives and choose and select development alternatives Because if I use, for example, a small n, I have a value, of, and then this company says this is not worth developing. But if I use a big value, then people say, oh, this is a very attractive project. I can develop it. And it's difficult. You have to be able, what we want to do on certain evaluation is in a way that it doesn't depend on the person making the calculation. Okay? You don't want to be the case that one engineer does a calculation, you get a high NPV, you say this is a good engineer. And then another engineer makes a calculation, gets a, a lower NPV, and said that's a bad engineer. Okay. And that shouldn't be your selection criteria. Okay. You should always these two engineers should have a method to find come up with some NPV but numbers that are that are the same. Okay. So just also a message for you in the future that you have to be able to defend your results 
<coughs> and uh, kind of be consistent, okay? <coughs> okay, so let's let's do that with an example, okay, with a very simplified example to calculate total recoverable reserves, okay, in an oil field and that also we write it in SP nomenclature NPU, the ultimate cumulative production, right? And we are going to assume this is simply a big reservoir unit and I'm going to estimate this number by rock volume that, that's a kind of a very trivial um, example but it's just simply to see what method do we use okay, what kind of methods do we use um, rock volume then I find the pore volume multiplying by porosity then I calculate the hydrocarbon volume multiplying by now first I need to have the net to gross which is in all of this volume I have some layers which are non-hydrocarbon bearing okay I have some layers with might be shale with might be um, uh, ceiling so uh, so I add that factor here and finally I have oil saturation to get simply the the volume of oil and all of this is volume of oil at local conditions Okay, therefore I have to divide by this VO. Okay, and that's a very traditional, very classical equation to calculate total recoverable reserves. Okay. All of you have seen this equation, I guess? Yep. Okay. So our exercise that you're going to make, that you picked up there probably, there are the pages, so it is simply looking at this very simple case, okay? And I'm going to say VR actually is not one number. It, depending on the geologists, the geophysicists, they told me, well, this can be belonging to a range called VR mean and VR max. Okay? I have some, some uncertainty. So it's not actually deterministic. If we call it deterministic calculation, is when we have one fixed value for all of them, and simply we go and compute NPU. We can go back to our manager and say, this is how much oil you have. Okay? That's what we say, deterministic calculation, all input. All input is known. Okay. Okay, but while you have a probabilistic calculation, and that's what we're going to cover here, is that the input is uncertain. Okay, you don't have one unique value, and also you don't even know what kind of values you might have. Okay, so let's, I guess some of you, you have some course in probability, right, or statistics before. Yeah? most of you okay but I will try to make it such that it's not too trivial for those of you who took an advanced course and such that it's not too advanced for those of you who you know who didn't take any course but essentially let's look at porosity right let's say you have a field and I'm able to let's say I have I'm a Donald McDuck okay I have a lot of money and I want really to say I don't want any uncertainty here. I want to know exactly what is my distribution of porosity. How does it look like? And I drill, I will here, I will here, every place. I am rich and I can say I'm going to drill everywhere. Okay, infinite number of wells. Okay, and I get a table for each one of these locations. Okay, and I'm able to do coring. I'm able to take out a core, not only with logging, and I'm able to measure actually physically porosity in the lab. Okay, So I have number of samples, and I have porosity, and I have a thousand, one million, or how many my money can buy. Okay, 
I go do measurement in the lab, say this sample has 18%, do another measurement, this one has 12%, etc. Okay? After I have that, I make a frequency analysis. Okay. Frequency analysis simply have two steps to make the frequency analysis. First, I have to create beans. Okay. And that means, for example, I have to create porosity 1, porosity 2, 3, and 4. Okay. Some, some number between the minimum and the maximum. And you decide how many beans you want to create. Okay. And then you start sorting all of these samples in each bean. Okay. For example, if I take a sample, sample phi i is between is between phi two and phi one. Okay. Where do I, I assign it? Do I assign it to phi one or do I assign it to phi two? I have different ways, okay, to assign it. But in this case, I could say if phi one is less than phi two minus phi nu phi one divided by two plus phi one, okay, that means exactly in the center of the interval. If it's less than that, it should be assigned to phi one. It will be counted as part of phi one. So let's make maybe try to make some numbers such that it doesn't sound too abstract. Okay, let's say 0 0.18 or 0 0.15, uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.25, and then 0.30. Okay, and let's say our phi i is 0 0.18. Okay, where do you count that that porosity value? Okay. You say, well, if it's the half of this is 0 0.175, right? So it will be counted as part of phi 2. You see, it's not exactly, it's not that this number is equal to 0 0.2, but it's that it's in the range between the two beans. Okay, so it will be counted as 0 0.2, which is a bit unfair, but, you know, that's the way we do frequency analysis, discrete, we call it discrete frequency analysis. Okay, we have to divide in some number of beans, and then we have to count. Okay. If you have one million samples, you can have a thousand beans. But if you have just ten samples, you cannot have ten beans. Okay. You have to have the number of beans has to be kind of a function of the number of samples that I have. And after I count them, I have the bean column. Okay. V1, V2, V3, V4. After that, I have the number of counts. Okay. X, Y, Z, W, for example. Okay. And that's typically what I report. Okay. That will be like a frequency diagram. I plot here in the x axis, I plot the number of counts. And here, I plot the value of the bar. Okay. So if in this case I have four, I simply will have phi one, phi two, phi three, phi four, and then I have maybe something like this. Okay. There is another way I can try. I can make another column, which is called the relative frequency. Okay. So here I have the total number of counts, total number of uh, n, okay? And then I say relative frequency will be x divided by n, y divided by n, z divided by n, and w divided by n. And it tells you that from all the samples you have, from that one million sample, 20% had this porosity. Okay, or let's say 15% had this porosity. That's what this relative frequency is telling you.
Okay, so far so good. Yep. Okay. Now I can also create something called cumulative frequency. Another column called cumulative frequency. And this one I can build it in two ways. So uh, cumulative frequency is x over n. This one will be y over n plus x over n. And this one will be y over n plus x over n plus z over n. And this one will be all of them. x plus y plus z plus w divided by n. Which is going to give you 1, right? Because that's the total number of samples. This guy will give you simply 1. So we know what this column indicates. We know what this column indicates. But what does this column say? What does this column indicate? Or if I plot it, how will it look like? If I plot this guy, the cumulative frequency. Okay, initially I start here, right? And then I go increase and increase. Maybe, maybe make the increase less severe. Okay, increase, then increase, and then increase until it reaches one. Okay, and it will be a chart. So, yeah. Okay, so what is this chart telling me? Below, okay. So you say here there is a something percent chance, okay, this number, or probability, that from all the samples they will be equal to phi 1 or lower, okay. And in this case you're saying I have so much probability, the probability of phi 1 plus phi 2, okay, that the samples that I take are going to be equal to phi 2 or lower. Yes, because I'm compounding the probability or the frequency of this guy plus this guy. Okay, so I'm saying these two combined, that means that have to be equal to phi 2 or lower, that's the probability I have in my sample, or that's the frequency that I have on my sample. Okay. And it gives you a chart like that. Why do we in petroleum engineering like this chart? The cumulative. Because we always want to see continuous, but also we want to see that we have these reserves or lower, at least. Okay, we want to have some guarantee that we have at least that number or lower, okay? So that's why for many variables, we use this guy, the frequency, okay? And for in petroleum, like reserves and volumes in place, we use the cumulative frequency, okay? Because it's like a guarantee. I go to my manager and I say, I at least have 20% chance, or at least know that I have 20% chance that I have at least this number or lower, okay? And that's giving like, a, it's like a guarantee uh, that I provide. Okay. Um, sometimes you also make the inverse uh, cumulative frequency in which you sum from bottom up. Okay. So this guy will be, let me just remove this guy from here. So this guy will be um, W over N. This one will be W plus Z over N. This one will be W plus Z plus Y over N. And this one will be X plus Y plus Z plus W over N. Okay? And this guy again will be 1. And when I plot it, the inverse cumulative frequency, it looks like that. Okay. Inverse cumulative frequency diagram. And here you have phi 4, phi 3, phi 2, and phi 1. 
Okay. And this number again here will be just one. And that's what I was saying here. What can you say about, for example, phi four? Before we said below, right? But now we say we have at least some percent chance that they have this number or some percent frequent. Um, they will uh, uh, twenty percent of the fees are going to be equal to a fee four or above. Okay, and here some percentage that the samples will be equal to fee three or above. Okay. And finally you say, well, you at least you know you have to be greater than this value. All samples are greater than fee one. Okay? And that's just keep in mind this is the chart that we use to to deal with reserves. Okay? This chart. We don't use the the ones on the top, we use this chart. Okay? The inverse cumulative frequency. <coughs> Now, what happens if we don't have measurements, okay? What happens if there are no measurements? So instead of saying frequency, we're going to call that probability, right? Instead of frequency, because frequency is when we have some data and then we can count it and then we can make that plot. Okay, but simply we call that probability of occurrence. Okay, and then the frequency plot or the frequency relative frequency diagram is called PDF probability density function. Okay, and the Cumulative frequency is called CDF, okay? Cumulative distribution function. But it's indicating exactly the same thing, exactly the same thing that we were saying here. What is now instead of from all the samples that I have, how many samples fall here? You say what is the probability that from all the samples that I have, how many will I have in phi 1? Or how many will I have in phi 2? Okay. Because it's not something that I have measured, but it's something that I'm guessing. I don't know really the probability. Okay. So now I ask you, what happens if I have no idea? Okay. If I have no idea about a variable, okay, let's say I'm in the same field, but now I'm a poor guy. Okay. I, I don't want to drill too many wells. And they ask me, without knowing anything, what do you think is the probability of the porosity? How it will look like, the PDF of the porosity? Okay. Let's say poor, poor boy, okay. And they ask you the PDF of phi. Okay. How is going to look like? From my reservoir engineer guys, okay. What what is the minimum porosity you can get anywhere in the world? You don't know anything about this field. The minimum porosity that has been ever measured in any field in the world. Five percent, maybe. Okay. So you say you don't know anything, right? But you say fee minimum is five percent. Okay. And what is the maximum porosity? Okay. Let's say thirty percent. Okay. Fee max. And then you don't know anything about the field, nothing, no idea, nothing. So you say simply all of them have the same, you don't know where it's located. If it's in the U.S. at Shale, if it's in, you know, in, uh, in Colombia that has f five Darcy's, 15 Darcy's, you don't know anything. So what you say, you assign simply all of them have, because you don't have any more information, all of them have the same probability of occurrence, all of them. Because I don't have more information at that point to make any 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 statement. Okay, if you have more information, you could say, well, in the world, for measurements that have been said, maybe it looks something like this. Okay, I have the most most of the fields they follow they are on this range. Okay, but that if you are educated, you have seen data from many fields, 
if you are working in a company you take Equinor and you see all the fields that they have okay but if you don't have any idea you are like me a poor production engineer okay you say that is you know that's what I have all of them uniform okay now what number do we have here before you know that what that number in the PDF was simply the number of samples right divided by the total number of samples okay the number of counts but what number do I have here here is a slightly different right because we are saying we can take any value is this is what we call not not discrete but we call it continuous probability and we know that the area under the curve right we know that all of our numbers should be here so we know that the area under the curve should be equal to to one right so we say the area is equal to phi max minus phi mean okay or the value of the variable times this number right this probability this p1 and that should be equal to one and that tells you phi max minus that the probability of one is one over phi max minus phi mean <laughs> we're taking soon a break so just don't despair I know this session is very heavy, so we hopefully we get to the exercise soon. Okay. How will that look like for porosity, or how will that look like for rock volume, or how will that look like? What kind of P I'm going to have here? It's going to be different, right? Different values because the range one is in million volume barrels of rock, the other one is in fraction. Okay, so but I'm, the message is here: it really doesn't matter what this number has. Okay, what this this value that this number has. Okay, it really it will be different for every case. If we have discrete, you can say, well, this is the number of counts, but this one is continuous, so it's really infinite you have an infinite number of values in between you can have point one five three two seven and you can put one five two one seven six okay and you have to have one probability for each so if you have a bigger range you have to spread this one this one will go will be lower okay now let's go to the probability okay to see how do we use these things to calculate Okay, so we have, let's say in our, going back to our exercise, okay, you have NPU, okay, that's an output, is a result of TRR, this equation, phi VR SO, net to gross, divided by BO. And here I have porosity. I have no idea how it looks like, right? So I just make a PDF, just like what we have done. If I have measurements, that's fine. But if not, I make a PDF. Okay, now if I don't know anything, simply I say a minimum and a maximum. Okay, then I take rock volume. Okay, which again, if I don't know anything, might be uniform. Okay, what else? SO, oil saturation. I don't know, okay, it can also be uniform. Let's make all of them uniform, just because let's say I don't have any more info, any, any other information, okay?
Okay, all of them have. Okay. Now, what is NPU going to look like? You know, this porosity can change between these two. All of them can change between, you know, minimum. Maybe I should make a use the upper bound, the max. Okay. You know, all of them can change between them. So how is this guy going to look like? Okay. If, let's say, if you have just two variables, right? A function, let's say the same exercise you have here. A function, x, y, and then you are able to calculate set right and you have x and y and you know these two guys they go how would you say a set looks like well it's very simple right you go and make a plot with MATLAB or your favorite Excel your favorite tool And you simply you say, well, that is my range that I want to evaluate. Y max, Y mean, X max, and X mean. Okay, and I simply for all of these combinations, I see how my function looks like, right? And I plot my function. Okay, and I see, for example, well, that's my and from there you can see exactly what is the range that I might have of my, in this case, my NP, right? You simply make a 2D drawing and I see the whole surface and I see, well, I can see now the N goes from the highest point to the lowest point, the Z, okay? And it's actually quite flat or it sharps, it has a sharp decline. I can say something about this function. What happens here? I have to use one, two, three, four, five axes, and I have to plot one variable with these five axes. Okay, how does does it work? We have to call a mathematician, right? We don't don't really know. So one approach we use. One approach we use. And we should take a break. Yeah, L let's take first a break. I think we we need a break. Okay, let's take a break and then we come back uh, and have, let's say, 15 minutes, 11.20. Okay. So I just want, before we see how do we deal with um, this problem, that we have all of these variables that are uncertain, and how do they affect the result. Okay, let's see how do we do this counting in Excel, because we don't have to do it manually. Many programs already have the counting and classification of each result um, automated. Okay, so I've given here a variable that has been measured, and the values are these are the values of that variable. They don't have anything to do with uh, any petroleum engineering. Just maybe it might be um, I don't know cost of a, cost of a burger in different places in the world, McDonald Burger. Okay, and you want to make a frequency analysis of this data. So one way you have to define first the beans, okay? Because that's what we have done here. We define the beans, and then from there we counted and classify each value in, in each bean. Okay. One way to do that, you can say just first to find the minimum and the maximum of the values of the variable. For that you can use this operator max. And mean. Okay. And the beans I say for example they are going from the minimum. And I want to get to the maximum and I have I have to define like a delta step to make these beans okay if I want to make it uniformly distributed 
So you say delta, okay, um, maybe we can say a bit better, number of beans. How many beans should we use here? Let's say maybe three or four. Okay, and the delta then would be the minimum, the sorry, the maximum minus the minimum because I want them uniformly distributed. And then if the beans are four, I have to divide by the number of beans, right? Minus one because I have to divide by the number of, of intervals, okay? One is the beans that are the points, and I have to divide by the number of intervals. Okay, that gives me three. And then I say start from the minimum, and then simply say the next one will be the minimum plus the delta, okay? Or the previous plus the delta. Okay? I end up with four beans, but you can change if you change here to maybe you want to have five now. I simply have to drag it one more, and now you will have five beans. Okay, so that's a way you can do generate your beans any way you want, but they should be uniform, distributed, not you know a, a crazy distribution. And and uh, so this is a good way to do it. You define number of beans, you define a delta maximum and minimum divided by the number of intervals which is the number of beans minus one and then simply you start with the minimum and then you sum to the previous the delta okay now to count okay number of counts to count I have to use a, a, a function called frequency so that I have to take all these because the function is outputting the number of counts in this column okay so that's why I have to pick all of them because it spits all of them at the same time okay and then I call the function that is called frequency I don't know if frequency will be here I think it's in the math or maybe it's statistics frequency okay it's this one frequency and you see it's applied to all of those so be aware of that so then you say the data that I have so you have to select this data and then the beans that you have how are you going to classify that data so you select these guys this vector so these are the data vector these are the beans vector and then to apply this function don't press simply enter because it's like a matrix function it's spitting a lot of numbers so then you have to use control shift enter okay control shift enter okay all of them keep them pressed control shift enter and that counted how many should be classified in one it said four okay between one and half of 3.25 how much should be classified in 3.25 which is in between these two and in between these two and so forth okay so let me just that you know how to make this frequency analysis in in X in, in Excel and you see the function has some brackets before and that's saying that it's like a matrix function it's like a vector function okay it's not simply a evaluating on a cell but it's actually spitting a lot of values at the same time And you're going to do that in the next exercise. Okay, so this is to create the beans. Find the maximum. Find the minimum. Then define number of beans. And calculate a delta which the delta in our case is max minus mean divided by number of beans minus one and then you compute each bean 
as bin i will be equal to bin i minus 1 plus delta. Okay, starting from min. Being zero will be equal to uh, the mean. Okay. Yes. The way that you constructed these beans, right now you have five beans, but uh, it's not really uniform. Yeah, that's correct. You should. Um, do you understand what Ping is, is saying? What is his uh, criticism? Maybe you can explain, Peng. What do you mean? Right now is counting four counts, but that's the four counts that equals to one only. It's not the range. It's a single point. So um, the way that you calculate this delta now actually is better to construct uh, four beans instead of five. And now the the first bean is starting from one to three point two five. Yeah. Let, let's let's wait with that comment. So. Let, let me just finish. So to apply frequency function, to apply the frequency function, okay, you have to use a control, and then you have to say shift, okay, and then you have to click enter, okay. But I will say in sequence, okay, and leave it pressed. Now, let me just. Um, okay, that clear. Selecting beings, it's it's a bit tricky. Okay, selecting beings, selecting beings must take into account. Okay, number of data points. Okay, so for example, if you have 100 data points, you can use 10 beans, but if you have 10 data points, it doesn't make much sense to use 10 beans also. Okay, also, if you see what Ben was saying very correctly, that you have, let's say, a max and a mean, right? And then you're defining, let's say, uh, three, right? We were no, we were saying four. Okay, so you define like that. You define so this will be your variable zero, variable one, variable two, variable three. But in reality, the way you classify this data is that everything that is in this two in this region, okay, it will be classified as a B one. Okay, and everything that you have in this region it will be classified as a V2 and everything that you have in this region will be classified as B3 and here in B0 so you see that the beans they are not exactly symmetric okay they are not because they are the one for B1 is very big the range and the one for B2 is very big but for these two it's actually less okay and that is so that's Maybe one comment of pain is that if we use this one as a starting bean, it will be more fair. Okay? If you use the minimum and the B1, you start this. So it will be minimum plus half of the delta. That will be your starting bean. Okay? It's valid. Also, there. be careful with how the count is made. Okay? Be careful. how the frequency is accounted for. Here I have made like an interval, it's is you know it's in between these two numbers, but I can have some counting uh, methods that they use, for example, this is B0, B1, B2 and B3. I have three beans. Okay. And then what they use if 
for example simply all of this range from here will be assigned to BO okay then B2 everything that is in between these two will be assigned to B1 and everything that is in between these two it will be assigned to B2 okay so my point here and I think yours Peng right is you have to be careful with how do you define your beans and you have to know also how they are classifying uh, the values okay in our case we're not going too much into that we are simply assuming so using this is a simple example to tell you how do you define the beans okay and you have to be careful with how many beans you use and you have to be careful with the counting algorithm so I, I will recommend you go to frequency search for this function in Excel and see exactly how it works okay how it classifies information but just for you to know and keep it in mind in the future in this course we are not going to look too much into that okay okay because you have you know minimum here is like the area is is much less okay it's only considering these two while b1 it takes this area and b2 is another area it's actually all of these okay so be careful of that but you know it's, it's like a let's call it here a comment courtesy of bank okay okay is that your how you how people call you peng yeah or they call you peng uh, like sometimes they pronounce both right uh, you're peng li is it uh, Okay, but they call you. Okay. Okay, but if in principle it would be Pengli. That's uh. uh yeah. Okay, we call you Pengli. That's fine. Or actually, Li is, is, is easier. Okay, Li. Okay. Okay, but just be aware of that, and we are not going to dwell too much on that because we have too many we're going to have a lot of samples okay so we don't care really the bean size and this classification it doesn't have that much impact okay but when you have very a few samples you have to be careful with with these uh, these things okay going back to our problem so what is the sampling method so we said if we have only two variables right and one solution we can make this plot right and if we cannot make this plot what we actually make is we make like a grid okay if you were going to make it in a more structured way and then from you make an evaluation of the function for each one of these combinations that you have here okay you go evaluate these two points calculate set then you go and evaluate these two points calculate set you make some sort of a grid okay and from this grid okay that, that's what we call a sampling method evaluate many combinations of x i y i okay of these two and then do a frequency analysis on the results Okay, so you will have X, Y, and Z, and you will have three columns, and for all of them you have X1, Y1, Z maybe 1, but then you have X1, but then you have Y2, and then you have Z1, 2, okay, and so forth. So you have many, many, in this case, if you make 20 by 20, you have 400 combinations, and then you apply a frequency analysis only on this column, okay, and you see how that function is distributed. So that's how we deal with with this case okay we expand it simply to that case we need to have samples so we need to have just the same thing we did here we need to have a sample in between these two right the minimum and the maximum and we can make it structured okay so we can make like these samples and then you can make it these samples and then you combine all of them okay 
So for example, if you have 10 samples here, 10 here, 10 here, 10 here, 10 here, how many calculations you have to make? Has to be every one with every one, okay? So you have to 10 to the power of 5, okay? 100,000 simulations. Okay? Okay, so for our case, if we're making, uh, this is called uniform sampling, requires 10 by 10 by 10 by 10 by 10, so that means 10 to the 5 simulations. Okay. So, if you see here, we have a simple equation in Excel, right? You say this doesn't take much time. This is simply, I just calculate that equation with Excel 100,000 times, doesn't matter. What happens if this process is a reservoir simulator to compute production profile, and I have to run it 100,000 times? How many years I'm going to be waiting for results? How much is 10 to the 5 times 10 minutes, for example? Let's say reservoir simulator takes 10 minutes. How many minutes I'm going to be waiting? 1 million minutes, right? How many hours, how many days is 1 million minutes? Can you calculate there? So we have 60, 24, we have... Um, Six hundred ninety four days. Okay. So it's it's something that is not really so feasible for for if you want to take decisions in a matter of months, okay, or, or half a year. Because you are just you say to your manager, if you want the result, just wait, I'm going to be come back in two years. A computer is running. Okay. No, no, you can parallelize put maybe 10 computers at the same time, but even if you have 10 computers at the same time, how many you need? Two months, okay? So it's, it's, um, so one of the methods I'm going to show you, one of the methods we typically use is called Monte Carlo sampling. Okay, and we simply there, we take, our, the first step is take a random variable a random variable in the interval. Okay, not a random variable, but a random value of the variable in the interval. In the interval, and you do that for each variable. That means I come to this interval that has been provided, and I take, for example, a random number here, a random number here, random, okay? I have to ensure that it's simply any number, random here, random here, random here, and then I compute, compute the output function, the output variable, And then I say number three is repeat, and you have to record also this variable. You have to record this the the result. Okay. Then you have to repeat one and two many times. What is many? We don't know. Okay. It depends on our power. We try 10, 100, 1,000, 1 million. Depends on each problem, okay? And after that, you, on the fourth, you make a frequency analysis. Of the results. Okay? And for example, you will see, at least for this case, okay, initially, this is NPU is going to have for example a distribution like that okay 
where is is amazing even though all the input is made in uniform distribution okay all the input is like that the output when i make the frequency analysis of the results is going to look like that okay. but that really the shape depends a bit on how the function is okay how the function looks like if it's a reservoir simulator can have one shape if it's uh, you know uh, another simulator can have another shape okay so it depends on the input but also depends on the simulator okay so you do you repeat many many samples until you don't get for example this is with 100 samples this is with 1000 samples and then you repeat for example with 1 million samples and when you don't see any big difference okay samples okay so you repeat start with 10 100 thousand and then we don't see your results change that much that's when you say stop okay um, So I have I have a discussion I will refer to it but uh, on the compendium my compendium Okay, so if you want to see more in detail, you want to read more in detail, I think it's um, Okay, so that's explaining this uh, Monte Carlo method, page 110. And then it tells you some way to estimate the number of iterations you need. Okay, that tells you if you take 10 samples, 100 samples, 1,000 samples, 10,000, 100,000, and a million. Okay, you see how your calculations are changing. And that's something you have to... You have to, to make... Um, Okay, that's page 110 of the compendium. Okay, and there is there also some discussion on number of required iterations. which is made in page, um, this is page 113. So if you, any of you wants to read uh, that there, they have uh, a, a kind of, I try to make a simple explanation why, how do you estimate if you need 100,000, 10,000 and 1 million, okay? But essentially you run with different number of samples and then you, um, you see how it's, it's changing, okay? Yes, so now you have almost everything you need to the exercise, but we are left without time. So you're going to work on it on Monday. So try to stay awake on Monday because you, you're going to work on that, okay? But, so one thing is the sampling is made on the CDF, okay? Not on the PDF because it's like a more n a nicer way to make the sampling. If you had the CDF, the PDF, right, which for uniform okay, variable looks like that, okay, you simply come and say, well, from a minimum to a maximum, I pick any random number, okay? But that will change the minimum and maximum depending on each variable that you have. Porosity is a fraction, saturation is a fraction, rock volume is a fraction. So you construct the CDF, okay? which in this case, how does it look like if it's uniform, the CDF? Only something like that, right? Up to one, minimum and maximum. 
And then you know the CDF, the cumulative probability, is always going to be a number between 0 and 1. Always. Doesn't matter what. Okay? So you have, you assume a number between 0 and 1, let's say 0 0.613 something. Okay? You come to this chart and you read from there the value of the variable. And it's a very nice, pretty way to make these random numbers. You have a random number generator from 0 to 1. You go to the CDF and then you read the value of the variable. Okay. Thanks. And if you want to make that into an equation, it's simply a straight line. So that tells you that uh, the variable okay, will be equal to, what is that? The minimum plus... plus 1 minus 0 sorry not the minimum but will be 0 plus 1 minus 0 divided by max minus mean multiplied by the random minus the mean right I think okay so then you that's uh, one formula you have program in Excel the the exercise we're making is on the website is on um, yeah the folder of today is called uh, triangular so it's exactly the same example we have in discussed you have rock volume porosity and this is the variation you have Almost all of them are uniform, minimum and maximum, but you have one which is triangular. Okay, but then you see if you go Alt F11, okay, you see the minimum. Sorry, that I think that equation is is wrong. It should be. Random minus zero. Sorry for that. It was correct. Uh, max minus mean divided by 1 minus 0 and this is minimum okay because you're simply trying simply to interpolate on this line okay so it's the minimum value plus the slope okay which is the maximum minus the minimum the maximum has 1 the minimum has 0 okay maximum has 1 minimum has 0 and then the random number you are you are guessing it's it's here okay so that's exactly if you see alt f11 that's exactly the equation that we have programmed here okay. so you provide minimum maximum and then from there it gives you spits a number of the bar okay so if you're going to use it here let's say this is simulation number one i use is x right uniform I use the minimum and I have to block maximum and they also have to block and enter and that guess the value between those two okay if I try to reevaluate the function it will guess another number because the random value is changing okay also you have one variable here which is they gave and I think just just for fun you don't not, don't all of them don't have to be uniform but in this case one of them was triangular okay okay it tells you that the recovery factor that you need here to calculate the TRR that we didn't do right the NPU should be have the recovery factor it has a triangle distribution okay The triangle distribution, how does it look like? On the PDF, you have a minimum, you have a maximum, and then you have something called a mode, okay, which is the most frequent value. Okay? And it's like that. And that is, for example, the geophysicist or the geologist, for example, they think, well, in that area, really we can have this variation. But it's most likely, someone with the experience I know from this area, from that region, most of our fields have had around this permeability, okay, or around this porosity, or around this recovery factor.
So then you have it's like a more educated guess. It's not simply that it's all of them are the same, but if you say from experience, from knowledge, from tests, from something, I can speculate that one of them is more likely. Okay. So that's that's. Um, so that's the case for one of the variables for f r u. Okay, that is triangular, and the triangular you can do exactly the same. The only thing is that you have to integrate now. You know the C D U, the C D F will be something like. Okay, will be something like. Like something like this. And you have, so the formula is also given here, triangular, minimum, maximum, and mode, okay? Okay, so those are the, the equations, uniform sampling, triangular sampling for the recovery factor, and calculation of NPU, okay? Uh, So that's what you're going to make next Monday and then finally let's hope that we have time to use Python because you will see Excel has a bit of a limit to do this calculation so using a language like Python or MATLAB is actually much more efficient okay? because we have to run a lot of simulations and if Excel wants to keep all of that in the memory it gets heavy 10,000, 1 million cells okay? we, if we have it in MATLAB Python has a more efficient way to save data and then it doesn't get frozen that often, okay? So, we didn't have the chance to solve the exercise today, but we are going to do it first time on Monday. We are going to solve it first with Excel, and then we solve it with Python, okay? So come prepared. For Python, we are going to be using an online uh, Jupyter called uh, CoCalc, and to have access to it, you have to create an account, okay? So please do it before before Monday. So hopefully on Monday we have the first hour will be you solve it in Excel, and then the second hour we solve it together in Python, okay, in CoCalc. Any question before we close? Okay, so see you on Monday. Have a nice weekend. <laughs>